What's up guys? This is the very first episode where it's just me, it's a solo cast. Also, this is the very first episode um, that, that's a lengthy episode that has no cursing. The reason for that, I'd like a lot of people to see this. It's very important that this information gets out. Uh, I'm not leaking anything. Don't Please do not uh, be concerned with that. I'm not leaking anything that anyone hasn't already said. I'm just trying to encapsulate everything that's going on in the IFB right now. I recorded this episode today. Generally, my episodes are recorded sometimes months, sometimes weeks in advance. This is recorded today because of the timeline that's happening right now in the independent fundamental Baptist movement, the people that are being taken down, and uh, those of us that are working hard to make sure this momentum continues and we stay on track and we have a united front. And um, I'm also going to talk about all kinds of things when it comes to uh, the responses from IFB leaders uh, to what's going on. I'm also going to be talking about how this happens in the first place. Um, why it is that, you know, when your pastor does something wrong, it's between him and God. But when you do something wrong, it's between you and the pastor. So if this is your first foray into Not Your Mother's Podcast or looking into anything cults, welcome aboard. I might suggest that you'd watch a previous episode, though I wouldn't want you to not watch this episode. It's very important that you see this and know what's going on. So sit back and feel free to shoot me a message. This is one where I need a lot of feedback. So feel free to shoot me a message, disagree or agree, or have more information you want to share. Please let me know. I'm open to any and all messages here at Not Your Mother's Podcast and on my personal Facebook page. Thank you. So like I said in the intro, if you're new to the IFB cult and um, this conversation, it might bode well for you to go back and watch some previous podcasts of mine or just do a little more research on the cult. This is not, what I'm saying is this is not the best introduction to this specific cult. But I'm by that I'm not saying don't watch this. By all means it's important that this video is consumed by a lot of people. I'm going to need you to bear with me. Um, the, I have a lot of reading to do today and it's just going to put context to what we're talking about. As you can see it's just me and so um, my first time doing what, what I'd call a solo cast. Um, the things I have to talk about, though, are things that uh, will keep the, the, the podcast flowing, and um, I, I know that you'll be helped by it, especially if uh, you yourself are a victim or you're close with a victim. So stay tuned, but there's a lot of reading uh, for me to do. This podcast is very timely. Um, there, it's not often for me that I try to put a podcast up uh, along with current events, in any way, shape, or form, excuse me. Now, of course, Christmas is a big deal for me. So that's probably the only one, though, that I, the episode of this podcast that I put up that was, um, you know, kind of running along with uh, a time frame, so to speak. Some of these episodes I filmed and then not posted for two or three months. Uh, my guests can um, attest to that. So, but with this episode, I do want to get into a lot of the things that are going on on the East Coast, but also here in Southern California with the Independent Fundamental Baptist Cult. Now, there are a few things that have yet to come to light that some of you already know about, some of you may not. There are a lot of things that have already come to light. That's what I'm going to cover. I will allude to things that are coming in the future, um, but I will not be... Um, you know, it's my, my, my goal in all of this is to help. My goal is to bring awareness to how awful people are being treated. My goal is to bring awareness to the fact that change must happen and it must not be delayed. Um, and my goal is never, ever, ever to uh, you know do anything that would not be advantageous for any victim of any you know anywhere, but especially with the IFB cult. And so. Um, anything that would not be beneficial to a victim, that's not something I'm going to be a part of. My mother is a victim uh, of, of someone in the IFB cult. And so, um, and I have very close friends that are victims as well. So please rest assured um, that that's not, th there's no personal gain for Stuart here. Okay. All there is here is truth, your truth, and a little bit of mine and it needs to be shared, it needs to be talked about. So, without further ado, uh, the uh, what I'm gonna get into first is the, um, I don't know what the right uh, noun is to describe it, but what's going on um, with North Valley Baptist Church, with Cameron Giovanelli, 
um, with Sarah Jackson. I'm going to read you a few things. First thing I'm going to read you is Sarah Jackson's testimony that she posted on Facebook, and it very much went viral, uh, at least in you know the group of, of people that I'm familiar with, uh, people that are supportive of her and people that are not. So I'm going to read you her testimony. Then I'm going to play for you and read back for you what North Valley and Jack Treber had to say about it. Then we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, then I'm also going to read you a few, uh, shall we say, notable uh, IFB former slash current leaders. They felt the need to take to the interwebs and write some things down about this victim and about the situation. And I think you'll find it very eye-opening. And again, it's just me on the podcast, so I understand that some people, and I don't blame you, may look at this as, well, you know, he just wants to be right, so he has no one else on, and he, you know, he just wants to spout his opinion. Take it how you want it, but um, the things I'm going to say, I'm very certain of, and the things I'm going to read are not things that I've made up. Uh, they're all very true things, and they're things, when I'm reading things that are coming from the opposite side of the spectrum, as, as, as I'm here, they're there, they are there. Um, when I'm reading these things, I'm I'm reading them as a literal truth from that person because that's how they meant it. Or guess what? They wouldn't have put it on the internet for all of us to check out. So first things first. Again, bear with me. A lot of reading to do. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to read is uh, just an excerpt of what Sarah had to say. If you go to my personal Facebook page, uh, you'll be able to see a public post. You just scroll a little ways, but you're able you'll be able to see a public post. Uh, from Sarah, a public post of mine that was a public post of Sarah's, where she gives a little bit greater detail uh, in regards to what's going on with her. But I'll jump in. Um, I was raised in a way where you respect your elders and your leaders. Your pastor in the Baptist faith is pretty much right under God. You trust him with everything. Excuse me. You go to him for guidance, advice, and wisdom. He's someone you... Uh, you can lean on when your parents aren't around, right? She says. Someone you, as a child, idolize, for lack of a better word. I did too. At 16, I was forced to grow up too quickly. I was put in a position no 16-year-old girl ever should be put in. Things were taken from me I will never be able to get back. When those things were taken from me, that should not have been taken until marriage, I was left with don't tell anyone and we take this to the grave. Cameron Giovanelli, my pastor, abused his power and leadership into creating a physical and emotional relationship with a 16-year-old girl that carried on her entire senior year of high school. I have kept quiet for 12 years because I'm not a spiteful person. This kills me to type. I cared about him, but I also cared for my innocence, which was ripped from me by someone I was supposed to trust. But as a 28-year-old mother to a perfect little boy asleep in his crib, I will do whatever I have to do to bring awareness so this never happens to another child. I have worked through a lot in my past, and this is the last thing I need to let go of to fully move forward. It was not okay, it's still not okay, and it will never be okay. Listen to your children, watch for signs, withdrawal, dis uh, depression, being distant, and get to the bottom of the cause. Always be listening. Be a listening ear and an open door for them to run to. Now, there's more. I, I don't mean to take anything she's saying out of context. So let me say once again, there's more at the beginning of what she wrote and more at the end that's a little more personal. I just want you guys to understand, uh, you know, the the um, the storyline that we're that we're talking about here. Now, uh, I'm gonna play for you in a moment. I'm gonna play for you the response. I'm gonna splice the video in here of the response from the church that is now or was at the time um, uh, harboring uh, Cameron Giovanelli and that's not for lack of a better word He's, he was absolutely being harbored there um, and so I'm gonna play that for you in a moment but I just want to give you a couple takeaways from what what we read here and that is the fact that we are raised and I don't think it's uh, unlike this in other cults but in the IFB cult the independent fundamental Baptist cult, we're raised to implicitly trust our church leaders. Again, not unlike many other cults, or even, uh, I wouldn't even say cults, I'd say a lot of religions are this way. And religions and cults, in my opinion, are not synonym 
synonymous, and then that's a, another story for another time. But um, she she trusted th the man who was supposed to help her in all things and be Christ-like in all things. And if we take the Bible, we don't have to take it literally, but if we just look at the teachings of Christ, it was a pretty pure-minded and clean and uh, uh, loving individual. That's not what happened here. By the way, I understand that for some of us, uh, this may seem a bit you know, ambiguous or, well, she's not really giving details or anything like that. Let me tell you something. Every IFB pastor that I have heard has given explicit details, whether it's in emails, text messages, from the pulpit, or in counseling, about sexuality. Let me, let me back that up and also say that as children, we're taught little to nothing about sexuality. So when your pastor comes to you and you, have, you haven't had sex ed because that is, that is uh, God would disapprove of that. That's, how, that's what we're taught. When I was taught to believe that sex ed was just this wicked, vile, awful thing. And I'm not saying that at four years old you need to sit your child down and explain to them how everything works. We're not going there at all. But as a teenager, these are things that you need to know. Pre preventing STDs, preventing uh, uh, early pregnancy, all these sorts of things. Um, that are, if you if you pay attention, these are epidemics, especially in the Southern California uh, 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 region of the nation where I live. Uh, so you're taught nothing about sex and sexuality, but the pastors speak of it from the pulpit in a way that is just, I mean, it's perverse for one, but it's very, very descriptive. So I'm sorry, let me back that up. What I'm getting to is for her to not give all the details on Facebook of what was done to her and how it was done, that's okay. It's really okay for a lot of reasons. The most important reason is people who are in a position of authority, uh, people who are the law, so to speak, do have those details and are taking care of this. On This is an ongoing thing. This, is, uh, um, this has been given over to the local authorities and this is being taken care of. So rest assured on that. But also understand that for her to share this on Facebook uh, was a very vulnerable thing to do. And I cannot, I'm not saying that you're a wicked, awful, terrible person for... For, for saying something like, well, you know, there's really no details, but that's okay. It doesn't have to be details. The details that we got as children from the pulpit were abhorrent and gross, and the fact that they were left out of everyday life for us as teenagers, they were preached from the pulpit. I, I hope I'm making sense right now. They were preached from the pulpit, and I mean things like, her pants were so tight, you didn't you lift nothing up to the imagination. That was a phrase I've heard over and over and over again as a teenager. Right, but but I was never taught in a class, in a classroom, or and again, this is no discredit to my parents, but never really given a birds and the bees talk. It just didn't happen, not the way that it should have, at least. And so, when you when you look at the disparity between the two, and the fact that your pastor is saying just incredibly overtly sexual things from the pulpit, and at home and in your normal life and at your Christian school, you're getting no sexual education whatsoever it's okay for her to, there's a lot of reasons, but that for me one of, is one of the biggest ones, for her to leave those details out. Her vulnerability and coming forward and saying these things is powerful. And for her to leave out some details, it's okay. Because again, where we come from and the fact that we, we weren't brought up with any kind of knowledge about sex or sexuality. So I'll get off that subject. Right now I'm gonna play for you um, Jack Treber's uh, response in the the the, uh, the video might be a little grainy, so my apologies, but it's not more than two or three minutes. And if you just want to skip it, that's fine. I'll recap after. But here is so again, we just read, and I know you you may want to rewind or go find it just so you have a better frame of reference. But we just read uh, Sarah's sort of coming out to everyone on social media and letting them know like this man is an evil person and he did evil things to me and something has to change. And now here's the response from the church that was harboring him. I can sense tonight that all of you have been affected by listening, and I'm not chastising social media. A lot of you know things are going on these days. And I have something to read to you tonight that breaks my heart. It's come to our attention that allegations of an inappropriate conduct have been made against Cameron Juvenelli, his staff member, our staff. Upon receipt of the notice of these allegations, we immediately uh, placed them on administrative leave of all activities and responsibilities 
so that we might uh, conduct a thorough and, to the best of our knowledge, honest investigation. During the course of that investigation, Cameron Giovanelli tendered his reg resignation to the ministry, and the resignation has been accepted. All responsibilities uh, in nature whatsoever were permanently and immediately terminated with the receipt of his resignation. There were no allegations of wrongdoing of any nature involved with the ministries of North Valley Baptist Church, Golden State Baptist College. I beg our friends that are watching and the members here that you keep the Giovanelli family in prayer and keep our church and our college in your prayer. So now you now you saw the response. Now you saw what the church had to say. Now you, um, I don't know. I don't really know. It's hard to know where to even start with that, because there's there are so many things that should have been said that weren't said, and things that were said, most of them shouldn't have been said. And by the way, he's reading this. This is not. This is a prepared statement. Uh, I'm going to read uh, read back to you much of what he said right now. And by the way. Let me add this. That video cuts off. If you if you pay close attention, I don't think I clipped it out there. That video, when it cuts off, he's still speaking. He, he, he makes very direct eye contact with the man in what we know as the PA booth um, so that the man knows to cut his mic, and he's still, he's still talking. So what he said after that, because I have friends who were in the audience that evening, uh, what he said after that was he just continued to belabor the point of, you know, let's pray for the Giovanelli family and we love them and they're such precious servants of God. You know, that if you're from this background or you're in it right now, you know the rhetoric. So anyways, uh, I just want to make note of that. That was not all he had to say. What was cut off was just more praise for the perpetrator. So let me read you the official statement. It has come to our attention. By the way, sorry. Um, I can, if you want to message me or you want to find out more about who wrote that statement, let me know, because I know exactly who it is, and that's a huge problem. Anyways, it has come to our attention that allegations of inappropriate conduct have been made against Cameron Giovanelli. That is true. A member of our staff, upon receipt of the notice of the allegations, hang on, okay. Let's talk about real life for a moment, shall we? And let me get another drink while we're at it. Oh. Let's talk about real life. This man has a job, and he has not only failed in his duties, he's literally done, you couldn't, as far as I, as far as I can think of it, you couldn't get more opposite of what he was supposed to do than what he did. Uh, for instance, I used to work uh, I've, throughout college and then um, uh, part of my time here in California, I worked on a dock. I was unloading and or loading trucks. It would kind of be like, I worked at Walmart, good times, and we would unload trucks, and uh, most of the freight had to be um, uh, put in a different, on different pallets for different departments, so it would come down a conveyor belt, and we'd, we'd uh, someone would be inside the truck, uh, taking all the freight off of a pallet, putting it on a conveyor belt, and we'd have to put it in, uh, man, I don't miss that job, we'd have to put it on different pallets to different departments it was supposed to go to. And then we'd take a break. Once the truck was completely unloaded, we'd take a break, and then we'd come back and make sure everything was correct and we'd start putting it in the areas it was supposed to go to be stocked later that night or if it was going to be stored for you know Black Friday sale, something like that. So again, on a on a you know everyday work kind of level, to me, and, and again, this is not a criminal thing. What what happened here was a criminal thing. What I'm referring to is not. To me, what that would be like is once everything was unloaded and everything was on the right pallet, right, and, and we knew where it was supposed to go, once that was all done and everyone went to break, that would be the equivalent of me moving everything out of the way so that I could get a pallet jack and putting all those pallets back in the truck, going and talking to the driver, letting him know, hey, your truck's going to go take off, and then all of our stuff goes on down to some other Southern California Walmart. That's the, the real life, real world equivalent, again, not in a criminal way, but that's to me, that's the equivalent of what this man has done. He's done the exact opposite of his job, and he's been doing the exact opposite 
for many years, and he's not the only one, and this isn't the only girl that this happened to at this man's hand. Okay, so let me continue to read the statement. Upon receipt of the notice of the allegations, we immediately placed him on administrative leave of all activities and responsibilities. Pause. Upon receipt of me loading that truck back up and sending it off, I would be fired. There wouldn't be administrative leave. There wouldn't be, you know, it sounds like you screwed up, man, but, you know, we're going to put you on leave. We're going to take a few, day, few days paid off. That's what that means to me, right, or even unpaid. Take some days off, man. Take, take some time and, and think about the fact that you just lost us hundreds of thousands of dollars. No, 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 I'd be fired on the spot. So there's that. I'm just trying to compare here real world scenario and what goes on inside this cult. Um, during the course of, the in of that investigation, Cameron Giovanelli tendered his resignation to the ministry and his resignation has been accepted. I was not behind closed doors for any of this, so I can't tell you that that's not exactly how that went down, but I highly doubt that's how it went down. I'm sure there's a lot of other scenarios that you can think of and that I'm certain of as to how this went down, and it's not as uh, PC as they're making it right now. All responsibilities of any nature whatsoever were permanently and immediately terminated with receipt of his resignation. There were no allegations of wrongdoing of any nature. This, this burns me up. Let me start that over. There were no allegations of wrongdoing of any nature that involved the ministries of North Valley Baptist Church or Golden State Baptist College. So? What, what, what is that? What? What is, what, what, what place, sorry, I'm, I'm dumbfounded. What place does that even have here? Like, we know he really screwed up and he was a terrible criminal uh, uh, who committed vile acts, but he didn't do any of that here. Two things. One, he probably did. I highly doubt that he did not. Two, what in the world difference does it make? How does that make a difference whatsoever? I mean, I granted, I understand that some people, you know, want to know, want to be relieved that he didn't do it. But in the back of their minds, why are they thinking he might have done it? Because he probably did do it. And I can tell you, uh, from personal experience dealing with these kind of perpetrators, it's never a one-time thing. And to say that he he didn't do it at all there at Golden State or at North Valley, sorry, just people haven't come forward yet. And by the way, they will be coming forward. At any rate, that just that really gets me going. To, un to, to see the priority that this church, this pastor, puts on uh, the, 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 what's the word I'm looking for here? They, they take away from the victim. This is, what has he said about the victim here? Not a word, not a word about the victim. But he closes with this, or they close, or what was written up for them closes with this. Please pray, please keep our ministry, the Giovanelli, Giovanelli family, and all others involved, in your prayers, all others involved. You couldn't bring yourself to say the victim or the victims because that would be more accurate. So again, just reading through what Sarah had to say and then reading through and watching what the response was, you tell me if that was handled properly. Now again, if you're still inside the IFB, as far as you're concerned, it probably was handled properly and I don't blame you for having that mindset, not one bit, because I can tell you right now, Five, six years ago, I would have had the same mindset. That's why I don't blame you. You've been brainwashed, just like I was. And I know that lately that's been a, it's been two things. It's been a very triggering term, and you can make fun of the whole triggering statement. I get it. Um, and it's been a very, a term that, uh, you know, that, that people want to shoot down a lot. Oh, brainwashing. Because when we think of brainwashing, at least when I think of brainwashing, I think of, you know, maybe Korea or Vietnam where troops were brainwashed to give away information uh, about uh, the locations uh, of, of our forces embedded in those countries. That's the kind of thing I think. I think of like, you know, waterboarding or just something very intense. By the way, I'm not making a comparison between that and this, but I will tell you right now, I've been brainwashed for a very, very long time. And if you're born into this or, 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 or brought it at a young age, by the way, cults bring you in at a very young age or at a very vulnerable point. This is a proven tactic. And by the way, it works very well. And you stay connected and you stay, um, you, you stay a part of everything that they do because you're dependent on them for so many things. And that, again, I've talked about that before and I'm sure I'll talk about it again. I'm getting off on a tangent. But the points that I want to make here are, here's this person's story and her vulnerability and her coming forward and saying, 
this is what happened to me and I, and I don't want it to happen to anyone else and um, you know there's there's so many so many variables here so many different things to talk about but I just want to look at the disparity between the two excuse me she's calling out a criminal and saying you know you did this to me and this is terrible and the people protecting that criminal are coming in forward and coming forward and saying you know sorry we, we, we didn't know anything and you know we told him to just take a break for a few no 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 if someone did that to your child to your mother to your brother to whoever to someone you're very close to you wouldn't want them placed on administrative leave let's be real people and again I'm not saying this to be argumentative in any way if you want to argue with me that's fine I've had plenty of arguments about this specific subject and others like it but I can tell you this if this was happening to someone who was very close to you, you would not be happy with a resi with simply a resignation and or administrative leave. It's not something you'd be okay with. I'm just we, we know. Just just think about it. Just give it a moment. Take a rest. If you're on your soapbox, put it away, sit down, just take take a couple breaths and think about if this happened to your mother, to your sister, to your brother, to your father, to your son, to your daughter. How would you respond? At, at any rate. That's how the church responded. Now, in addition to all of this going on, a pastor by the name of uh, Stacy Shiflett uh, also put out a video that was that has since been taken down, but I've reposted. And if you want to see it, uh, let me know. I'll get it to you. Stacy Shiflett is the pastor of the church where this actually transpired. So let me give you a quick timeline. This transpired when Sarah was a teenager, and uh, I do not know the exact location or the exact church. If, if you want to know. Uh, shoot me a message and I'll get that information to you. But this happened when she was a teenager. She, I think she states uh, 16 years old. And this was on the East Coast, in the church on the East Coast, I believe. And again, correct me if I'm wrong and, and, and I can get you all that information. So when the current pastor of that church, who was not involved to my knowledge in any of that that happened to Sarah and, and between Cameron, when he found out, he immediately contacted North Valley Baptist Church where Cameron has was at the time currently on staff and let them know, hey, we've got a problem, we need to talk about it, we need to fix this. He didn't hear anything back. All he got was he saw the video that, that I showed you that I put out um, uh, in response to the allegations that were made by Sarah. So what he did was he made a pretty lengthy YouTube video, almost 20 minutes long, where he called out Jack Treber in North Valley Baptist Church. Please forgive me if my timelines are off, it is possible that he put that out before Jack Trever um, came out on a Wednesday night. So I could be incorrect on that, but as you know, I don't really edit this podcast too much, so I won't be cutting that out. At any rate, within a couple days of each other, these two videos surfaced. The one of Trever at the end of uh, Wednesday night service, um, you know, letting people know that Cameron had been um, had been fired, let's be real. And then the video of Stacy uh, letting um, everyone there, everyone in his congregation and, and the world over uh, know how he felt about it and that things had happened to him in the past, which I won't get into, that's his personal story, but things that endeared him to this case and made him very much aware of what Sarah was going through. So that video, um, you know, sparked a lot of interest on the internet. I got quite a lot of views um, and was eventually taken down. But in response to that video, I'm naming a lot of names here. That's not something I do often on this podcast. I try to try to add levity I may have mentioned that earlier but I try to add a lot of levity and and have fun with things but today is a serious day and this is a, and not that anything else I've mentioned hasn't been serious in the past but this is something that's happening right now and this is something that you can be a part of and help with and if you want to please message me and let me know whether it's on my personal Stuart Hardy or not your mother's podcast um, but what 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 happened was in response to Stacy's video now in Stacy's video there's nothing uh, uh, that he states that is untrue. It, I mean, if you really want to go down the path of not wanting to, if you really want to go down the path of victim shaming, that's fine. I've seen it done a lot. Okay, but it's, this isn't the time or the place. And I'm not saying that every, I have to be careful with this because I don't want to say that every single person that comes forward is not doing it for some kind of personal gain. But you don't come forward in a place where Sarah's at in her life and where many of these women are that have come and by the way are coming forward soon you, you guys are in for some it's, it's going to be intense the next few weeks the next few months and I hope the next few years until the IFB um, 
fizzes, fizzles out, burns to the ground, um, the ship sinks, the dragon uh, is, is slain. Um, it's going to be really intense, and I want you to be a part of it, and I hope you will be. And maybe that's why I should have ended the podcast with, and now I'm off track once again. Um, but in response to Stacy's video, and again, in the video, that's what I meant, was, was getting at. In the video, Stacy doesn't say anything that's untrue. He gives his own personal testimony. He talks about how everything was entirely mishandled, how the authorities were not involved from the get-go, uh, and they definitely should have been. I don't know if he states that they should have been, but they should have been. So he makes his video, and f um, for all intents and purposes, he basically calls out a very big player in the IFB realm as the pastor and the church. He calls them both out, and he says to them, like, how, basically, how dare you? How dare you mishandle this? How dare you do this the wrong way? Um, what were you thinking kind of thing? And again, like I said, that video was later removed. And, and I do have a different, uh, the same version of it that if you want to see it, please, by all means, let me know and I'll send it to you. Um, but in response to that video, this is what I was saying earlier, I am going to name a lot of names. These aren't names that, that people um, associated with the information that I'm sharing. They want their name shared along with this information. So this is some, this is not something that I'm doing that they would not appreciate. So the people that are on the victim side and the people that are quite clearly on the perpetrator side both have been very outspoken about where they stand and what they want to say. So in response to Stacy's video, here are a couple articles that were written online. This is not a name I ever thought that I would not, not that I never thought I'd bring it up on the podcast because it may have come up before, but not a name I really ever thought I'd see again in fundamentalism that was trying to spring up in a big way or, or, or make more known. This is a name, this is a person that uh, my dad would go to his annual soul winning conferences, and um, I love my dad. I, I, would, I would move heaven and earth for my father. I love him very much. But when he would come back from these conferences, you know, he would be very... Um, you know, we'd have a fire lit under and be very evangelical. And we may we do a lot of soul winning for a few months. Be really intense with the soul winning. And if you're not familiar with soul winning, to, to give you a, a small example, that's the people. Mostly Jehovah's Witnesses are known for it. Um, but Saturday mornings, they will, will come by and knock on your door. And the famous meme, uh, "Do you have a moment to talk about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ?" That's soul winning. Uh, so my dad would come back and just man, it'd be very intense, and 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 he'd be really excited and fired up about it. But this man in recent years, I, I know, um, I, I met him uh, in 2007. Very, you know, it was in a, in a, in a, um, a setting with, with family and whatnot, and it was very, very laid back, and it was very enjoyable and relaxing. He gave me a solar pop, I think. Um, but I just, I just didn't think I'd be bringing him up, especially in this light. But again, this is something that he published on the internet, and it is lengthy, so... If for the next, if you skip the next five or ten minutes of uh, the podcast, maybe more like five. If you skip it, I get it. If you just want to kind of hear my dish at the end on it, because I'll be referencing things that he said, that, that's totally fine to understand. Um, but I'm going to try to read it. Um, on a, uh, is that a bridge the right word? I'm going to try to read it just straight through, but I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. Most likely I'll, I'll have to <laughs> calm myself, have another drink or two, and just kind of speak to how crazy the it is what's being said. But again, this is in response to a victim telling her truth, speaking her truth, and saying, this man did horrible things to me. This is also in response to another man coming forward and saying, it's not right what was done, and, you know, it's not it's not right what was done in the past when this girl was 16, but it's also not right what's being done now by this current pastor who is, uh, who's, who's just not really, just, just let well, we're going to let him go. Like, you, you're not doing what your people and your congregation needs you to do. You're not doing what the human race expects expects of anyone in your position. You are not doing what the human race expects of you. You're not treating us like humans when you do this. Um, and I, that's not what Pastor Shiplett said, but that's what I'll say. And uh, so basically this is in response to a man and a woman both coming forward and saying there is some terrible wrong going on here. You handled it terribly. We reached out to you on multiple occasions. You gave us little to no response, and now we've come forward because of your lack of execution on doing the right thing. I don't mean execution in the literal sense, but I mean in, in your lack of coming through when anyone and everyone would expect you to. We've had to put this stuff on the internet to force your hand. So let me read this to you.
from Bob Gray Sr. Facebook, the judge, the jury, and the executioner. Definitely going to start off uh, with a drink. By the way, this is not, it says wild turkey. This is not wild turkey. I'm not that strong a man. When I watched this, watched this video, I was disturbed on many levels, is the title uh, of the first paragraph. Over the past several days, a very disturbing video has been circulating on Facebook. It was made by a Baptist pastor making accusations against another preacher and another ministry. When I watched the video, my heart was broken because of the gross error being perpetrated in this video. I felt it my duty to respond not only in defense of the accused, but in the defense of truth and justice. By the way, I'm not going to be able to make it through without having my own commentary. The accused here, why are you, de why are you defending the accused? Really. The accuser has brought forth things that that, that uh, local investigators deem, and he, this man knows this, she's brought forth things that local investigators deem worthy of latching onto and digging deeper and finding out what's going on. That's the accuser. The accused, if guilty, is, is, is just oh, awful, reprehensible things this man has done. That's the first accused and accuser. The next is Pastor Shiflet and Jack Treber. I won't give him the title of pastor. So Stacy Shiflet and Jack Treber are now at odds. This is now the new accused and accuser. The accused is saying, hey man, I reached out to you. I tried to handle this. And by the way, the way to handle this is not to keep it in the church. That's what everyone always wants to do. And there are more than, there are multiple cases right now where that's still trying to be perpetrated, where people are still trying, uh, church leaders are still trying to keep it just inside the church. Uh, don't don't contact local law enforcement. Don't contact a legitimate attorney. Um, let's let's keep it all with us. So um, that's the first accusing accuser is Sarah and Cameron. The second accusing accuser is Stacy accusing and Jack being accused. And what he's accusing him of is just gross, gross error and not handling things the way he should have handled them, the way any person should have handled them. So that's the accused and the accuser. There's two sets of them. But Bob Gray here, Bob Gray Senior is uh, alluding to uh, Pastor Shiflet and Jack Trever and the fact that Pastor Shiflet has come out and said, hey man, you let this guy get off the hook and we weren't trying to do that. We were trying to be nice about it, but now can't do it anymore. All right, so I hope that sets the stage. One, oh, I'm sorry, please do not misunderstand. I am not concerned with winning over people who delight in any negative they can find against independent fundamental Baptist pastors. I put these people in two categories. So again, this is, this is me. And this is some of you. One, the first are those who hate us and would do anything they could to destroy us. Sounds a lot like um, the enemy or the devil, right? As we know him. Oh, the devil's just, man, the devil's hard at work, so we got to work harder. The second are those who are drifting away from us and looking for some excuse for their changes via accusations. They cannot merely drift without blaming someone, so this is fodder for their foolishness. I, I just can't like, make what you will of that. This article is not to try to persuade these people to stop their foolhardy slander. This article is to those who are sincerely questioning how to handle the information received from this video. Excuse me. So technically, I shouldn't be reading this. But I think there are some of you who may fall into that latter category. But So this is for you, and it's for me, and everyone else is just tired of this stuff. There's almost too much wrong with the video to cover it all in one article. I know of others who plan to respond and will, that's Alan Domley, I'll get to his soon, and more to what I am writing here. When I watched the video, I was disturbed on many levels. Let me share some of those that I hope will help clear up why you should reject this video and its content. So my apologies right now, um, I do not intend to read this video. You know how when uh, someone you're at odds with, whether it be your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, authority figure, you know, how you imitate them. I'm not trying to do that voice, so my apologies if that's how it comes off. Um, could be the whiskey a little bit, but um, which Bob Gray would be very upset at me for. Um, but uh, I'm not trying to come off that way. I'm trying to just read it as as I assume he wrote it. So he's throwing in scripture. Scripture, Second Samuel one twenty. Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Again, Old Testament. So. 
I was disturbed because I do not need to know the alleged sins in another Christian brother. Why do I need to know about another's allegations against a brother? What right do you have to fill my mind with such information? What right did the women, countless women, who came forward uh, about Bill Cosby, not countless, there's a lot, but what right did they have to fill news reporters and uh, um, uh, their attorney and, and, and um, the Today Show, what right did they have? What right did, um, uh, man, I can't remember the guy's name that, that ran for, I think, in the state senate in Alabama, what right did those girls have to come forward? Uh, Roy Moore, what right did those girls have to come forward and say all this information? This is victim shaming at its pinnacle, at its finest. What right did Sarah have to come forward? And say, what right did Stacy have to come forward and say that? Um, you know, what what right did these all these many many women come? What right did these women have to come forward and and and, and tell their sordid tales about Harvey Weinstein? Weinstein, yeah, I think they say it. What right did they? He's now in custody, as far as I understand. Like, what right? What right do you have? As a, well, you don't have a right as a victim. You don't have a right. How how opposite is that to humanity? And loving people. And by the way, I was I, I studied Jesus for a long time. How opposite is that of Jesus? Let he who is without sin among you cast the first stone. Is how it, I believe it is interpreted in, in the English language. What? That's giving all the right to the victim. He's taking it away. That's the opposite. That is the opposite of Jesus. I was disturbed because the world does not need to read about these types of situations. They rejoice when they see these things and will use them to bring damage to the cause of Christ. I was disturbed because the anger rather than the godly sorrow I detected in the messenger on the video. Godly sorrow does not threaten. I, I, I've talked about God before and, and how I feel about Him or, or, or don't feel about Him. Um, but let me just put this question to you. Feel free to shoot me a message answer it in the comments. Why would you want to believe in a God, or how could you believe in a God that just wants you to be sad about this and not do something about it? This is a church leader under God, right? And instead of being angry and wanting justice done, you should just be sad about it. That's not a God worth worshiping. Come, let's be real. People, come on. That's the God you want to worship? And again, I'm not trying to be angry at you. I'm just dumbfounded that there are people out there that still have this mindset of, you know, well, this is the God I worship, and, you know, he just wants me to be sad about about pedophiles. He doesn't really want me to do anything about it. That's what's being said here. I'm not, I'm reading this. This is, this is from solvechurchproblems.com. I'm reading this to you right now exactly as he wrote it. I was disturbed because of the unscriptural reactions by many who viewed the video. The responses were almost as foolish as the content in the video itself. Uh, I got out of, out, out of uh, order here. I was disturbed by the foolish accusation of cover-ups to which he referred, where in the Bible, in context, does it say we are to uncover such things? I am not misinterpreting this. I am not taking it out of context. He is literally, t literally telling you not to uncover things that have been covered up. He's using Old Testament, 2 Samuel, to say, you know, if, if the pastor covered it up, I'm, I'm not misinterpreting this, people, and, and I'm sure I'll get comments and messages to that, and, well, you took it out of proportion. I have a message sitting in my inbox right now saying, why do you twist uh, this, this certain pastor's emails out of context and twist his words to say something he's not saying? This is what Bob is saying. He's saying, leave the cover-ups as they are. I was disturbed at the lack, he goes on to say, of wisdom shown by the man who made this video. This is the stuff that immature Christians do. This is not what a man of God does. There is no strength in accusation and slander. Slander is a word that independent fundamental Baptists love, by the way. Hatred is a word they love as well. Hatred is something that they use often, and it's also a tactic that they use. I have been called a bitter, hateful person on many sign-offs to arguments that I've been in on YouTube, Facebook, what have you. And to say I'm not bitter or hateful, I'm not going to say I'm not. 
but that doesn't diminish how I feel or my truth. Just because I have a certain emotion or feeling, that, and I'm, the, this, these aren't common threads where I'm cursing a lot and being super angry. We know that side of me, you know, it, it comes out, and I will, ref, I will do my best. I'll bleep if I have to. I'll, I want this video to go as far as it can. I want as many people as need to see it to see it. So there will be no cursing in this video. I think I referenced that in the beginning. But I've had many people sign off where I wasn't being, I was being argumentative, yes. But I was not being hateful or mean or bitter. And that was their sign off as well. You just sound like a bitter person. You're right, I'm bitter. Absolutely. You're right, I'm hateful. Absolutely. Hateful. Like, that, that doesn't, if someone is bitter or hateful because of something awful that happened to them or things have happened to me, things that I can't get into detail on here because it's not time yet. It'll be time soon. But things that happen to their things, if someone's bitter or hateful because something happened to them or their family members that was just criminal and awful and whether it was sexual or physical or emotional, whatever kind of damage was done to them, if they're bitter and hateful because of that, so be it. So be it. Let them be that. We need counsel, we need therapy, whatever you may call it. I go to therapy often, and I am a big fan of it, and I am an advocate for it. And I've told many friends who have shared these types of stories, hey, please, not in a demeaning way, but please seek out some good therapy, whether you need to be a Christian therapist. And this is to those, I'm going on a rant, I'll be quick, but to those of you that have been through something like what Sarah went through, or you have a family member, or you, you finally exited, or you're in the process of exiting from the IFB cult, or something similar, and you have a lot of bitterness and hatred, please go get therapy. This is not coming from someone who is coming at you from some biblical standpoint or some church standpoint. I'm not a leader in a church with any kind of authority. I'm not in a church at all. I'm just telling you from someone else who's been through something similar to what you've been through, take the time to get therapy. And again, this isn't meant to be demeaning. This is a, a tangent. This is just Stuart talking to you now. But please take some time to get, to, to get some help for yourself. And again, I'm not saying that like, you have no right to be bitter. You have every right to be bitter and hateful. There's nothing wrong with that. Letting it eat you up is where you're going to have a problem. And I know that's something that's repeated by the IFB, by a lot of pastors, by a lot of Christians, and they're not wrong. Letting it eat you up, like you've heard a gazillion times, it's going to kill you. It's like drinking the poison. Oh, no, am I using that illustration? I'm sorry. But it is. It's like drinking the poison that's meant for someone else. But it doesn't. that's not to say it doesn't have its place. It has its place. So if someone wants to shoot you down because they think you're bitter or hateful, sorry, it's not valid. All right, moving on. I was disturbed because of the unscriptural reactions. I read that. I was disturbed because of the threats made to another man of God in order to get his way. Really? You threaten that if they do not do it your way, you would attempt to destroy them? Oh, the arrogance of such behavior. No, no, no. It wasn't Stacy Shiflett's way. It wasn't even God's way. It wasn't. It surely wasn't the church's way, because the church's way is to keep it under wraps. It's the way of the law. And I will be the first person to tell you that our justice system is not without flaws. It surely is. How, and again, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but how there's ever a statute of limitations for any kind of sexual misconduct, which, by the way, in Sarah's, Sarah's state does not exist, and in California does not exist. It was overturned because of Bill Cosby's actions and them being proven. It doesn't exist here. And that that doesn't just apply to one type of thing. It applies to a myriad of things, uh, especially if you're a minor. So, um, and I can get into that another time, or if you want to message me and you want to talk about that, feel free. But that is a, a very true statement. At any rate, um, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't arrogance, and it wasn't, hey, it's got to be my way. It was, this is the law, and you're not only skirting it, you're hiding from it. That's what was in the video. I was disturbed at the bitterness. What did I tell you? I detected from, from what he claimed happened to him in the past. I did not need to know those things either. And once again, it was one man's unsubstantiated accusations. Again, I won't go into that. But if you want to see the video, let me know. I was disturbed because of his blanket condemnation of fundamentalism. Yeah, I do that too, a lot. The only way he could surmise his opinions is to have read other things about which he did not know. Obviously, he is 
in the know regarding situations about which he doesn't need to be in the know. He is the pastor of the church where a man took incredibly unfair advantage of a teenage girl in, in, in awful ways. Yeah, he needs to be in the know. Absolutely. He needs to be able to tell law enforcement what happened. He needs to be able to help his church. Like, like, look, let, let me get on this. On, 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 let me, let me put on a different hat for a moment. He needs to be able to help his church members deal with this. Is he? I don't know. I don't go to that church. There are very few videos of their, of their, uh, of their. Um, uh, the word escapes me. It shouldn't. Of their services online. Uh, I, I don't know. Is he doing? Is he doing a good job? I'm not saying he's not, but I don't know. But he needs to be. He needs to be in the know. I mean, we all need to. But this man, most especially, for many reasons, needs to be in the know. I was disturbed was disturbed by new converts and weaker Christians whose faith is being shaken by the accusations made by this man. That's, that's not something that he knows, but okay. And they should be shaken. They do not need to know this. They do not need to watch this. The teenagers in youth departments across America who are on Facebook do not need to see this and have their faiths shaken. Shame on you for putting this out, and shame on those who have shared it. By the way, I, I went an extra step. I shared it. I downloaded it and shared it. I was disturbed because none of us know all that is behind this. That is a, that is a statement that the IFB and many cults love, love, love to, to hang on to. Yes, I know the next video is loading. I'm aware. I can see it up here. We have only been told, we have been told one side of a story, and even then with no real evidence. A man holding up a telephone and saying he has all the evidence he needs is not enough for an indictment. By the way, <laughs> I know I haven't laughed a lot in this, and I don't intend to. All of our phones, let's be real. Unless you've got the old school Nokia, maybe. Majority of our phones have a few things that maybe we wouldn't want someone to see. And it's not necessarily that it's a bad thing, it's just... Not in their taste. Maybe something you wouldn't want your significant other to see. Maybe something you wouldn't want as a as a thirty what am I a thirty three year old almost thirty three thirty three year old man. There are things on my phone that I wouldn't necessarily show my parents at this age. Is that holdover from being from growing up in the IFB? Maybe, but to say like you can't just wave a phone around and say you have all the information. Oh yes, you can. I think um, Bob Grace Senior may need uh, help understanding what all a phone can hold. Yet so many praise this man, ah, there it is. Yet so many praise this man for accusations made without even a fraction of all that needs to be known before justice can be done. Somebody once asked Dr. Hiles, don't you want to see justice done? If you don't know how I feel about Jack Hiles, scroll through my feed, you'll find out. They asked Dr. Hiles, do you want to see justice done? Dr. Hiles responded, yes, but I want to see justice done justly. Okay, Dr. Seuss. I was disturbed because one witness who, had, who, who wasn't even a witness was the accuser. I refuse to receive accusation from him. I cannot biblically receive it. Those who do are disobeying God's word just because he says he has evidence doesn't mean he has evidence, and it doesn't mean that evidence is true. Man, those are, those are strong accusations in and of them. Strong accusations in and of themselves. Just because someone says they have evidence doesn't mean they have evidence. Why would you go and post a video on Facebook, a 20-minute video on Facebook, call out a national leader in an organization and say, I have evidence, if you don't have evidence? I'm not saying it's never been done. I'm saying Stacy didn't do that. I was disturbed. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me let me get, catch my place again. Um... I was disturbed because the situation is still as of yet unresolved. Let it take its course. Let God be God and let the rest of us stay out of his way. This is, this is something that I'm very familiar with. This gives those who are trying to manipulate the situation and control the narrative, this gives them the time that they need to do so. No, there's no more time. This happened many, many years ago. There is no longer any need to wait for anything. I was disturbed because the portrayal of himself as a victim. I fear we often misunderstand what victims really are. This should be good. He calls himself a victim because he was propositioned. Am I a victim every time I am enticed to sin? It appears to me that he has claimed victimhood as his defense for attacking another. Again, just an incredible amount of victim shaming going on here. 
I was disturbed because of his self-praise. He let us know how brave he is. He let us know how faithful he is to the truth. He let us know how much better he is than the rest of us in regards to handling sin. Did I need to be told by him how wonderful he was, wonderfully he was handling things? If it's not about him, then why did he talk so much about himself? Man, oh man. Bob Gray, you're amongst many, many IFP pastors who every sermon we listen to... I'm not saying Stacy didn't talk about himself in this video. That's, that is neither here nor there. But you bring up a good point, Bob. And the point is that every IFP pastor that you will listen to without fail... Go to Hiles Anderson College, listen to the last... I don't care who it is. Listen to the last two or three chapel messages. I don't care if it's Mike Douglas... I don't care if it's Aaron Eggers. I don't care if it's Steve Frost. I don't care if it's um, Pastor John Wilkerson. Whoever it is, I challenge you to find me an IFB pastor, church leader, evangelist, who does not devote 25% or more of the time in his sermon to talking about himself. That includes personal illustrations. That includes uh, soul winning numbers. That includes um, how many people come to his events. They talk about all these things all the time. So, Bob, you are not the right person to be trying to call someone else for someone else out for something you're doing. This is quickly turning into a conversation between me and Bob, which I highly doubt he'll ever see this video. That's okay. I was disturbed because he tempted me to make a judgment about someone in a situation in which I have no jurisdiction. Oh boy, I'm kind of reading ahead. This is going to be good. Someone questioned Dr. Hiles during the trial of O.J. Simpson. While most of us were deeming him guilty before the trial was even over, a person asked Dr. Hiles his opinion as to whether or not he thought O.J. Simpson was guilty. He responded by saying, I hope not. I hope he's innocent. I don't want anyone to be guilty of something like that. Say what you will about Jack Hiles, but he was a master of avoidance. And both, I want to see justice done justly. What does that even mean, man? You're not Socrates. I hope it's not true. Well, of course we hope it's all, of course all of us hope it's not true. That's not what we asked you. It always grieved his heart, Jack Hiles' heart. So now we're talking about Jack Hiles. His heart when someone was guilty because he wanted people to be innocent. His question was not, how can I expose? Why would it not be? It was, how can I help and salvage a life? That does not seem to be the question that we ask in our day, but it needs to be. No, it doesn't need to be. If you want to salvage a life, salvage the life of the victim. Pay towards a charity that helps victims. Support the victim. Send them a supportive. Do you know how many these women that come forward are super, super brave? Um, I'm not going to curse, but brave AF, if you will. The amount of hatred I get a minimal amount of hatred for the information that I put out on the internet. The stuff that they put out, the hatred they get is overwhelming. Now, look, if you are a current, if you have been a victim and you're looking to put some information out and come forward with your story, please. I beg you, don't let that discourage you from coming forward with what has happened to you. Don't let it do that to you. I understand that it is discouraging, but please don't let it discourage you. There is a network of people, myself included, who are there to bolster you and help you through this process. If you need to call us every single day or call us about every single breakdown, we are there for you. We want to help you, so don't be discouraged by Bob Gray's words here. Please do not. Yes, we need to expose these things. Bob Gray is literally saying, let's not expose these things. Just like Jack Hiles would. I was disturbed because it obviously caused division among the brethren. Alright, if any of my family watches this, watches this, or if you want me to explain it, let me know. Detention among the breadworms. Anyways, that's a little inside joke. But it was just right there, I had to. The vitriolic responses have been disturbing, brought on by this video. I was disturbed because of the false allegations that we, fundamentalists, are not concerned with so-called victims. Spend more time trying to, uh, I spend more time trying to help those who have been wounded by other sins than any other single thing in my ministry. We're going to talk about yourself there, Bob. And I lost my, my, my place here. That said, I am responsible to also reach out to someone whose sins have offended another. I'm super confused by that. If someone wants to message me, let me know what he means by that. It is a blatant lie and a mischaracterization of fundamentalism to say we do not care about those who have been hurt. That's not a lie. That's the truth. How can this man say it is about time we cared about the victims? Unless he knows whatever fundamentalist, what every fundamentalist pastor in America is doing is in similar situations. 
He does not know. Oh, yes, he does. You all do the same thing. He only knows the ones who other accusers, such as himself, made private matters public. Yeah, it's about time they were made public. I was disturbed because of his willingness to pay money to perpetrate these accusations. Why not use that money to win souls instead of to slander another church and Christian leader? How dare he spend money to boost viewership and try to hurt another ministry because he does not like the way they handled matters. It's called a Facebook ad. Super cheap. Super cheap. I saw the Facebook ad. It was a dark post on the church's Facebook page. It's no longer there. There's a lot of reasons why I know it's a dark post. If you want to know what a dark post is, hit me up. Dark post isn't a negative or bad thing. It's just part of marketing. That church might have spent 20 bucks on that thing. Okay? So, I don't even know where to start with that. Like, If you don't understand marketing, don't try to get into it. Please don't. But they might have spent 20 bucks. How many souls is 20 bucks going to see saved? Maybe 20 souls? All right, I'm sure Bob will handle that in a weekend. I <sighs> just, it's so much. I was disturbed because of his mishandling of justice. It is not our responsibility to judge one another. When Dr. Hiles was once asked, are you concerned with carrying out justice? He responded, I am concerned if I try to carry out justice where it is not my jurisdiction. Let justice be carried out by those placed in the proper position to deal with the situation. Let us not become vigilantes seeking to be a judge and jury of others. Facebook is full of such vigilantes. I'm not saying Facebook's not full of vigilantes, and I'm not saying I'm not one of them. But to try to, excuse me, to try to call people out, I need a drink. One moment. see this is we're getting to him next um are you not concerned with carrying out justice jack Hiles, jack Hiles said i'm concerned if i try to carry out justice where it is not my jurisdiction check it out so jack hiles is not a was not and neither is bob gray uh a um they're a member of the clergy right they they it is not their job necessarily to uphold the law so if they make an accusation, yes, they can possibly be sued for slander or libel or what have you. And some of you are familiar with that. Some of you are not. I think a lot of people watching are familiar with these things. But they're not lawyers and they're not, um, they're not law enforcement officials. So for them to go vigilante, okay. Like what repercussions are there? Like I understand you could besmirch and ruin someone's character. I'm not saying that that hasn't happened and won't continue to happen in the future. Um, there are people I just saw a week or two ago about a man that was falsely, uh, and I know this happens often, was falsely uh, charged and convicted and did time and then got out. I know it happens. Making of a murder was a huge, uh, I think that's what it's called, it was a huge Netflix uh, phenomenon. And that's what it's centered around. I'm not saying that never happens. But when you've got a victim that comes out and says their truth and you can't just, you, you, you can't just listen to them, you've got to immediately shut them down, it's a bigger problem. Mostly, I was disturbed because this video was totally unscriptural in every way. That book, the, the first time it was interpreted into English was 1611. The times are a-changing, and they have been for a long time. I'm always wary of anyone who wants to, um, not necessarily against me, against anyone, wants to make an argument about something being unscriptural. Everything's unscriptural. No, really. Really. They read tablets back, not, you know, not that tablet. They used tablets and parchment back in the day. My Bible, I've got three or four, King James, of course, Jack Hall's signature on all of them, or Jack Scott. They, uh, they're unscriptural. Really. People didn't read the Bible like that. They didn't read it in that language. They didn't read it in that format. Everything's unscriptural. So that's like, I don't even know what to say that's like saying. I, I don't know. That's like saying plants are unhealthy. I, I don't know, which people think marijuana is. So, um, huh. I was disturbed because I saw no concern for the restoration of the accused one. The accused one, that's Cameron Giovanelli. We need to return to biblical restoration. I hear so much about biblical discipline, but the fact is there seems to be more, to be, much less interest in restoration than there is in discipline. In fact, discipline is restoration. That is its main purpose. Why did he not get 
on an airplane and fly out there to see what he could do to help his brother. You make of that what you will. Mostly I was disturbed because there is no scriptural basis for what he did. It is absolutely impossible to justify what he has done from the Bible unless you take it out of context, which you do every Sunday. Which many are doing. Oh, okay, good. My friends, sin abounds more today, both in the world and in churches. We must not react to sin. We must respond in two ways. We must respond legally. When authorities need to be contacted, which they should have been, you know, 10, 15 years ago when this happened. When authorities need to be contacted, we should do so and then leave it in the hands of the authorities to carry out justice. That is the opposite of the whole last thing I read. I have faced these situations and always did what the law required. I highly doubt that. I have called the authorities and, with a broken heart, reported a man for alleged crimes. I don't, okay. It is never right to hide a crime from the proper authorities, but that does not mean we have a right to go to then go to to then go try the man in the courtroom of Facebook. How unjust that is. What? 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 Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, Instagram, whatever you whatever you may have. Like there's CNN and Fox and Huffpost. And I'm not I'm not getting into that debate about who's right and who's right wing left wing. Any of that. Your new news comes to you on Twitter and Facebook. And Instagram. That's the news. And what this man is saying is after a man is convicted or taken to the police or taken into custody, that should not be shared anywhere. That shouldn't be news. Are you kidding me? That is that is the definition of news. Even a murderer gets his day in court. This guy, O.J. Simpson, uh, you know, he's got a lot to say about murders, gets his day in court and, and is allowed to present his side of the story. Since when is Facebook the judge, jury, and executioner of a person? Since never. It is never. That is not what it is. That's not what's going on here. That's us speaking our truth. That's what we're doing on Facebook. It's not judged. As far as I know, Cameron Giovanelli is not locked up right now. Maybe he is. I could be incorrect. But because someone posted something on Facebook, does not send someone else to prison, to jail. That's not how that works. We must respond. This is the second way we must respond. I'm sorry, I'm getting very spirited here. I'll calm down. The second thing he says is we must respond spiritually. And then he quotes, Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. While it is not easy to juggle dealing with someone who makes an accusation and the one who is being accused, we as Christians have a responsibility to do what is right for both sides. I'm tired of hearing about both sides. If it is true that a man has violated a child, then we must do our best to help the child go from being a victim to a victor in Christ. Where's the millstone being hanged about the neck? That's New Testament. I don't see that in here anywhere. Maybe maybe he's going to get to that. Sorry. We, must, we also must restore the one who has fallen the best we can. The question was asked, restore to what? Why is that always the question I hear? It ought to be restore to who? Restore to Christ. Restore them to fellowship with the Lord. Restore them to some opportunity to serve God, even if it is even if it be behind bars. Restore them to Jesus Christ, their Savior. Okay. I'm not even going to get into that. What many of you may think right now, I'm going to get into. I'm not going to. I'm not here to bash Jesus. I'm not here to bash God. I'm not even here to bash religion. I'm here to tell you that this man has used Scripture several times, and um, I do not know the reference, but you have heard. If you've listened to much preaching, you've heard that it is better that a millstone be hung about his neck and he be cast in the sea. This is what Jesus said. This is what Jesus said about someone who offends. That is a broad spectrum. That's not just rape. That's not just molestation. It's, it's broader than that. To someone who offends a child. And as a parent of a child, I'm with Jesus on that one. Okay? So, Bob has left out so many things but the one that comes to, to me, especially in this last paragraph I read, is we've got to restore the fallen. And I'm not saying that there isn't room for restoration or for healing. I'm not saying that. And especially if you tie it to religion, it can, it can sh very much seem that way. I'm just looking at what Jesus said. Jesus said, drown them. That's what he said. It's, it's better. He said it's better that they be drowned in. I, I don't know. Again, Contextual wise, uh, out of context wise, I don't know where you want to put anything, but I'm having a, a, a hard time with the way the scripture is being used here and the scripture, the part, the portions of scripture that are being left out. 
In conclusion, oh that God's people would grow up in this matter and quit acting and reacting like the world. We need to use common sense, but even more, scriptural sense, in handling these matters. As I close this article, I am forced to do something that I seldom do. I am calling on those of you who care about justice and about what is right to openly rebuke this pastor who has openly accused others. Excuse me, openly accused others. I call upon you to let him know that he is not the hero that others are making, trying to make him to be. He is now the hero of many of our haters. They can have him. I turn him over to them. What does that even mean, man? Unless he repents of what he has done, he will be of more hurt than help to the cause of Christ and cannot be dealt with as a brother. There's some jargon there I'm not familiar with. If every accusation he made is proven to be true, his error is still grievous and wrong. This man is saying that if Stacy Shivel, even if everything Stacy said is correct, and if Jack Treber and Cameron Giovanelli and all those involved need to be punished, this guy is still wrong for breaking that information. A rebuke is called for, for concerning this pastor for being an instrument of Satan, and I know that judgment for such misbehavior will come from God. Don't buy into his scriptural method, you, oh, an unscriptural method used by this pastor. I. I have more to say about that, but I think I think I um, yeah I took I think I took about half an hour or so looking at the clock here on that, but um, I think I just spoke to everything as, as as I read it. But there's just so much there that is victim shaming and continuing to put the man of God on a pedestal. Then I don't care world leader, uh, uh, movie star, no one, and it's not about deserving it. It's about having it given to you and abusing it. It's been said, uh, my friend Josh Owens, I don't know if this is a direct quote, but I've heard it before. And, and Josh said to me the other day, because we were talking about this, and it's very it's shiny forehead. It's very, um, it's very true. Ultimate power ultimately corrupts. It does. You give these guys too much, too much leeway. And this man is fighting... Bob Gray is fighting to have the same level of, uh, you know, he, wa he wants that. He wants, the undercurrent here for me is, hey, don't come after me, okay? I'm making my statement about this, and I'm blameless, but you better not come after me because I know that that's wrong, and you should know that that's wrong because I'm the man of God. I'm going to, I don't know how much more time I can spend on this. I have a few more things to read to you, believe it or not. And if you're tired of hearing me read, hey, and you want to check out, I get it. Thanks for staying this long. But, um... That title, the man of God, if you grew up in or were in this cult like I was or, or in other cults, the man of God, um, is not to be questioned. The man of God is uh, pretty much perfect and blameless. In fact, I was talking to a friend of mine earlier this morning, and uh, I said something and I wrote it down because I felt like it, it's, uh, I'm sorry if you can't hear me, um, I was talking to a friend of mine earlier this morning, and I said something, and I wrote it down because I think um, it's true. I think it sums up well the dilemma of the position we put these men of God, air quotes, in. When something is wrong with the pastor, so for instance, Cameron Giovanelli and, 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 and Jack Scopp and Joe Combs, and the list goes on and on. When someone's wrong, Jack Hiles, by the way, if you don't like that, just do a Google search. When something is wrong with the pastor, when he's done something wrong, when he's sinned, when he's when he's in prison, do you know that there's a support group for Jack Scott right now? I think it's called We Love Our Pastor, Jack Scott. And it has, last count, it has 259 members. I'm not mad at those people. I get it. I know. I was there. I didn't want to believe that for a long time. And I was amongst those that rebuked others who said, you know, it's true. No, it's not true. It's a setup. He's doing time in the federal pen. It's not a setup. It's true. He confessed. He tried to get out of it. But when he does something wrong, when the man of God does something wrong, it's between that man of God and God. But when you do something wrong, God doesn't come into play, except for judgment's sake and what the pastor can hold over you. 
when the man of God does something wrong, it's between the man and God. When you do something wrong, as a member of an independent fundamental Baptist congregation and many other types of congregations, it's between you and the man of God. God's not involved. He's not. So many times this has happened. This has happened to me. This has happened to so many other people. And, and Bob Gray is a perfect example of this. God's going to judge him because he's the man. He's talking about the man of God. And, and, and I rebuke him, and, but ultimately God's going to judge him. Guess what? I'm not saying to believe in God or to not believe in God. And I'm not saying that if there... I hope... I hope that there is a God that just hates this kind of stuff. How he lets it happen, that's, that's the tough part for me. Some of you too. I've talked to you. I know I know you. So that's a tough tough thing for me to swallow. That's part of part of my, my you know, difficulty in the belief. And, and there's a lot of ways to explain it. I get it. I've heard them all. I've preached them. Okay? But... The point I'm making here is when the man of God comes to you about something that you did wrong, there's going to be, there's a price to pay. But when the man of God does something wrong, well, he's just, he's fallen from grace. How many times have you heard fallen from grace? Man, I've heard that too many times. Whether it's a pedophile, whether it's a rapist, whether it's an adulterer, whether it's just a, a person who just has a, a falling out and they're just a, a a, a mean, angry person that's in a position of authority and wields that authority to, to be mean to others. Whatever it is, a fallen from grace is, I've heard it so many times. And by the way, a lot of these men, Cameron Giovanelli, unfortunately, probably included, and others who, who, who are going to be named in the near future, there will be a group of people, I guarantee you, just like there are for Jack Scott, that are, that are going to pray for this man, that are going to have nothing to do with the victim, that are not going to support her, they're not going to send anything positive her way. In fact, it'll be mostly negative, her or his way. And what's going to happen is they're going to continue supporting this man. And there's going to be a whole narrative around how he fell from grace and how he rose from the ashes. And he's a great man of God. And they're going to compare him. They're going to compare him to the Paul of the New Testament who murdered countless people, uh, allegedly, right, that were Christians. They're going to compare him to David who had an affair with one of his soldiers' wives. And then had that soldier killed and then took him, took her to be his wife. There are going to be all kinds of comparisons about all these wicked, terrible men in the Bible that God used. And how this guy is just another one of those. Get out of here with that stuff, man. Just, just don't. I, I just, I, I can't get behind it. Anyways, that's my, that's my point. That's the point that I wanted to make. Excuse me. Um, that's the point that I wanted to make is that when you do something wrong and you're a member of an IFB congregation, it's between you and your pastor. God doesn't come into play. He'll, God will come into play, but the pastor will control that narrative. He'll tell you how God feels about that. He'll tell you what God... Um, just, and I'm not knocking Catholics, okay? They, they got it together, all right? In a lot of ways. But it's uh, it's your penance. It's, it's just the Hail Marys that you have to do, and I don't know. All I know is stuff from movies, okay? Let's be real. But, like... It's, it, the pastor will come into play with what needs to happen, what course of action needs to be taken for you to be uh, reconciled with God. That's not between you and God. He'll say it is, and he'll tell you to pray and read your Bible and, 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 and get your budget in order and, and make sure you're attending church and make sure you get more involved in the Sunday school program or the bus ministry. But God didn't tell you that, and God didn't tell him to tell you that. All right, next one, Alan Donnelly. So, Alan Donnelly, some of you may know, is uh, Baby Jack Hiles. So he's, uh, that's what I call him. Um, he sounds, he still wears Jack Hiles ties. Jack has been dead since uh, 2001. Jack has been dead 17 years. And he's still wearing the same ties that Jack wore. Just a little tidbit for you. He's actually on the screen right here. Oh, that is not one of those ties, though. He just did the, the pocket thing. Do you know about that? Anyways, he imitates Jack Hiles. Which is better now because Jack is dead, but when he was alive, it was weird. So, um, if you want to check this out, message me. I'm not going to put these things. I always say I'm going to put things in the link, a link in the description, and I don't, so I apologize. But if you, if I talk about something, I've referenced something. Message the podcast. Message me. Message Stuart Hardy. Even if we're not friends on Facebook, I'll get the message. I'll respond. If you want uh, further reading or you want more information on something that I'm referencing, I would love to give that to you. So um, I, the only reason I'm not putting it on um, the podcast in this instance other instances I have forgotten but in this instance in this instance I'm not trying to get it uh, through the airwaves anymore than it already is 
So it's called the Old Paths Journal, oldpathsjournal.com. By the way, uh, Bob Gray's site is, if you want to look at it uh, further, is solvechurchproblems.com. The name of that article I just read to you is Facebook, the Judge, Jury, and Executioner. The follow-up article is pretty rough as well. So May 22nd, 2018, Alan Domley writes an article called Publish Not. Now, I will give this, and, I, and this is you know me being snarky, but it's me. Um, I will give Bob this. His editors are better than Alan's. Maybe Alan doesn't have any. Uh, the grammatical errors in uh, Donnelly stuff is pretty rough, so bear with me as I do try to read through it. And this is again, oh, you're just making fun of me. Yeah, I kind of am, but really, like you should have it together at this point in your life. Better than someone who's way younger than you, and way less experienced. Okay, so Alan Donnelly published not. We live in times when a week rarely passes without some new accusation coming out about someone. It never fails that people through the accusation to read about. Um, See, throng, okay, no, that was my mistake. Throng to the accusation to read about the dirt, slime, and allegations that is being thrown at an individual. Sadly, much of the accusations that have been thrown at people are nothing more than conjecture, lies, and attempts to bring down someone that those who accuse don't like. I'm not saying there never has been a lie about a man or a woman that did something and it ruined their reputation. That's happened and it'll continue to happen. But what he's referencing is not that. What he's referencing is Cameron Giovanelli. Cameron goes right along with Harvey Weinstein. Cameron goes right along with uh, Louis C.K. Cameron goes right along with uh, Bill Cosby. He just does. This is the time. This is the Me Too movement. This is the Time's Up movement. This is the time. Like, this is the time that all this stuff is going forward. And I love all you amazing women and men, who, uh, Terry Crews included, who have had the courage and you can say what you want. Oh, it's not courageous. That's just ruining a man's character. Whatever you want to say. If you had an insight into the awful, wicked, hateful, vitriolic, I think that was one of Bob's words actually, messages that these people receive. And by the way, most of them know going in, they're going to get a lot of hate mail for it. They know. If you saw those messages, you'd understand how brave they are. So, the com... The common line of these who spread accusations is that they are tired of cover-ups. He uses air quotes, or he uses quotation marks. They then take it to another level and want to blame the whole independent Baptist world as being guilty of all these cover-ups. My answer to those who think the independent Baptist world is guilty of massive cover-ups is that a handful of people who have covered sin doesn't make the whole movement guilty of cover-ups. Yes, it does. It is Satan's attack. There we go, Satan's tactic to condemn this movement so that the lost souls will never listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Satan's not involved here at all. The truth is what's involved here. Satan's not, Satan's not around, man. I'm not saying there is or isn't a Satan, okay? I'm not saying he's real or he isn't. I'm just saying this has nothing to do with him. This has to do with someone speaking their truth. And as far as I've said it before, it bears repeating because so many people still don't get it. If you don't want to be a part of the independent, fundamental Baptist movement, or more accurately what has been said to me is, you can't lump us all together, we're not all the same, then guess what? Lose the name off the sign. That's all it takes. Stop saying it from the pulpit. We're proud King James only, uh, skirt wearing, uh, hellfire and brimstone preaching, independent, fundamental Baptist, bless God. Stop saying that stuff. Just stop it. And then you'll stop being it. That's really easy. I am all for the truth being known and the guilty being punished. Again, these there is a... I'm going to read you the definition of cognitive dissonance. We're going to get to that. But I, I have to say it now. Because Bob and Alan, like, there's this back and forth of, I want justice for the victims, but Satan is working hard against these good men of God who are being accused. Those aren't... You can't say both those things. They don't work. To get, they don't work in tandem. I am not for the guilty getting away with sin, however. I am against this thought. I'm not, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. I am not for the guilty getting away with sin. However, I am against this thought that the whole world needs to know about matters that are none of their business. Like what? I am of the school of thought that the news media shouldn't even have the right to publish about someone being arrested until they have been proven guilty by a court of law. Okay, I, <laughs> I'm telling you guys, this is real. I'm reading it. You can look it up for yourselves. Um, 
Likewise, independent Baptists should stop spreading dirty laundry when what has been accused hasn't even been proven by a court of law. When David, told you, was informed about Saul's death, his response was the response every believer should take when someone has been accused of sin. David said in 2 Samuel 1.20, Tell it not in Gath. Well, there we go. It's the same one Bob used. Publish it not in the streets of Ascalon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. David didn't want the enemy to have, oh, he's using Joel Osteen, that's my boy, to have any reason to rejoice when Saul and Jonathan were killed. Was Saul guilty of doing wrong? Yes. However, David still knew it was wise to handle these matters rightly and privately so that God's name was not marred among the heathen. Who cares about God's name being marred when you're hiding sexual predators? You're trying to run these two things in the same vein. They do not go together. Understand this, people. It's not about God's name not being demolished. When you have someone that you believe making an accusation against a church leader that is that horrific and criminal, it goes to the police. It does. That, that's, just, that, that, that's just human nature. It goes to the local authorities. With this story in mind, let me share with you some thoughts about how to handle an accusation about a believer. Oh, thanks. Yes, you are going to have to deal with it, but you certainly want to be sure to deal with it in a scripturally with it scripturally and in the right spirit. Number one, accusation doesn't prove guilt. That's true. Whatever happened to innocent until proven guilty, just because someone has accused another person of wrongdoing doesn't mean it is true. But sometimes it is, dude. If someone is guilty of wrong to the point that they have broken the law, let the law deal with it. Right, but you have to tell the law. If you're hiding it from the law, the law cannot deal with it. I'm going to get pretty spirited on this one as well, just heads up. I may turn the volume down while I'm reading these. Um, but publish it. Sorry, let me read that again because I left off the, the, the last thing. Um, if someone is guilty of wrong to the point that they have broken the law, let the law deal with it, but publish it not. It doesn't make any sense. Just because someone says that they have proof doesn't make it right to spread accusations. My friend, I would rather be wrong about believing in someone's innocence than to be wrong about believing in someone's guilt. That sounds great, but the history of the IFB, it doesn't work that way. You're guilty. Just because someone has accused another person doesn't make it truth. That statement in and of itself is not incorrect. However, oftentimes it is true. And it doesn't mean you need to jump on the bandwagon, but it also doesn't need, mean that you need to continually strive to discredit the victim and their experience and the horror that they went through. Number two, just because you can't doesn't mean you just because you can doesn't mean you should. If I can, I will. The internet has made it too easy for someone to post their opinions and accusations about others to destroy them. Psalms 101.3. Why do these guys not use the New Testament? Psalms 101.3 says, I will not. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. If accusation causes me to turn aside to look, accusation has then taken me away from, the, from what the Lord has called me to do. Massive massively taking this out of context. You would be wise to say uh, that you will set no wicked thing, including accusations, before your eyes. Nearly every church pastor and individual has had to put up with the accusations posted on the internet or digital media. Did, did you, those are synonymous. Okay. Let me caution you that just because it is on the internet and just because it may sound believable doesn't make it true. Can I tell you how many times I was told, you can't tell me and I can't tell you how many times we were told not to Google our church, our pastor, if we were involved at First Baptist Church of Hammond. We were told that the internet is full of lies. Let me tell you something. As a digital marketer who works on the internet every day, if every article on the first page of Google says the same thing, it is true. End of story. <laughs> Again, I go back to my first point, the accusation does not prove guilt. Number three, it's not your business. If you are not an involved party, it is nothing more than gossip. Why do we think that we have to know all about the dirt being spread? Uh, maybe so we can protect ourselves and our children. I don't know. Let me go a step further and ask, why does someone think they need to let the whole world know about their disagreement or spread an accusation that is yet to be proven? 
to protect people. Oh, good, New Testament. Philippians 4.8 gives the believer what they should think about when it... <clears throat> gives the believer what they should think about... Oh, tells the believer what they should think about when it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, blah, 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 you know, just good report on and on. Uh, Josh Holmes actually mentioned this on his most recent episode of Good Humans. Check that podcast out for uh, less uh, angry videos. Um, uh, audio recordings, that is. If it is not of good report, it is none of your business. That is not true. Don't complicate your life by soaking your mind with the dirt of accusation. It has nothing to do with you. You would be wise to stay out. This is quite the wrong sentence. Stay out of it and keep your mind focused on what you are supposed to do. I am not saying that one is not right and, and one is right and another is wrong. Yes, you are. I'm saying it's not my business and it's not the whole world's business to know of something that is not their scriptural right to deal with, nor will it help the cause of Christ in reaching the lost. That's what these guys always come back to. Is it helping the cause of Christ? Is it reaching the lost? Hang on, let me play this one really quick. Well, unpause, I'll upload YouTube. Come on. All right. So, uh, that, that was the end of it. These guys just get so caught up. This is their, they want to hang all things on, like, look, this isn't helping the cause of Christ, so it shouldn't be a thing doesn't matter man it's the truth it's going to come out and whether it hurts the cause of christ as you put it or not that is by that is entirely by the wayside these guys are bringing this up as a main point and it is not even remotely a point whatsoever all right number four it is a local church matter god chose a local church to handle these matters this is this is textbook cover-up okay um and God, there he goes. He's already talking about cover. God chose the local church to handle these matters. It is amazing to me that those who throw the cover-up card say they believe in the local church. Again, the word believe is just so misconstrued here. Just because you... Like, yeah, of course I, I believe in the local church. I There's probably one five minutes from me. There's a cult 15 minutes from me down the road. I believe that it is there. So, again... Work on the English language. Um, yet they want to use a universal church philosophy in handling these complicated situations. If we believe in the local church, why are we trying to deal with this in a universal church mindset? To warn everybody about pedophiles. That's why. Matthew 16, 17 says, And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if it neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. God didn't say to tell it to every church. He said to let it to tell it to the church, which is the local church. How a local body deals with something is not another local body's business. Yes, it is. Every person will be wise to stay out of the business of another local church. When that when that business involves something that is criminal in nature, it is everyone's business. That's why we have news stations so we can warn people about bad things before they happen to them. It's very basic and very simple. And again, taking the scripture out of context is just these guys' cup of tea. And if you can't see that from this, you will never see it. Well, I hope that you, if you can't see that, I shouldn't say it that way. If you can't see it, I hope that one day you can. But it's going to be a, a tough road for you. Number five, Jesus' example was to save, not destroy. Again, I'm not for the guilty walking free. That's not true at all. He is. All you have to do is read my book. Oh, all right, we're pumping the book. Ah, oh, He didn't even put a clickable link to it. You guys got to work on your marketing. America under attack, and you will see that I am not for covering up sin. However, our savior, Savior's example was given that he didn't come to destroy, but to save life. That is true. Matthew 5, 17 says, I am not come to destroy. Notice that the Savior made it clear that he didn't want to destroy the Savior's desire. And focus is found in his statement in Luke 19, 10. Dude, stop skipping around. Stay in one gospel. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The believer should never be bent on destroying anyone. I'd say Jesus made quick work of destroying the money changers tables in the temple, wouldn't you? With a whip and with flipping them over? I mean, I'm not for an angry God, but I kind of like that story. So, Jesus isn't about destroying anything at all? Yeah, he is. Absolutely he is. And believers should be as well. The believer should never be bent on destroying anyone, but on trying to save everyone from sin. The believer's mindset on how to deal with sin is found in James 5.20, which says, Let him know that he which covereth the sin from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. 
I need to read the rest of that chapter because that verse is really suspect. Let me read it one more time. James 5.20 Let him know that he which covereth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from sin and shall hide a multitude of sins. I don't know. Number six, what about restoration? Whatever happened to the mindset of trying to restore the fallen? Oh my God. Galatians 6 1, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Okay, fault is a broad term. Very broad term. If I overcome a brother in a fault, meaning, uh, overcome, is that the word come upon, whatever it was? If, if, if I find someone who's at fault, Let's say they screwed up on their taxes. Maybe I could help them with that. If I find someone's at fault for raping a teenager, I am not going to help such an one. It's not going to happen. In no way, shape, or form. If you follow my preaching, you'll know that I believe that a person must come clean before they can be restored. But it is not my job to do the work of the Holy Spirit and try to convict another of their sin. Right, I mean, it's the prosecutor's job. The believer's job is not to keep the fallen down, but to restore them. Jesus never dealt with sin to destroy, but to restore. Remember, the woman caught in the act who others wanted to kill, of adultery. Why can't you say that, Al? Jesus dealt with her to restore her from her sin. The believer should be busy about trying to pull the fallen out of the slime pit of sin instead of trying to push them down further in hopes that they can never be restored. For the record, I hope Jack Scop is never restored, so he can never do that again. Just for the record. The mindset that someone should never be restored is not of God, but is of Satan. My mindset is of Satan. I'm fine with that, really. God chose to publish it not. David said, oh, we're back to the Old Testament. David said, publish it not. It is harder for one to be restored when they have been drugged all over the world with accusations that are not always true. It's why we have the sex offender list, man. God never said to bring sin before the world. He only said to bring it before the local church when they refused to repent. Again, you're using a broad term or you're saying sin. So sin applies to much of what I do in my daily life. The things that I allow myself to view, the alcohol that I allow myself to drink, um, 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 the words that I use, the music that I listen to. These are all sins according to the way this scripture is preached. But murder is also in there. And so is rape. And so is molestation. And so are a multitude of other heinous, scary, uh, awful things. So when you're making, again, I'm guilty of the blanket statement, IFB are all bad. Okay, I get it. But when you're making the blame, bla blanket statement about sin or, or fault, and you're not categorizing what it is, it's not helping your case. And now I've lost my place again. Again, I go back to the fact that sin must be dealt with in the local church, not on the World Wide Web. There's a lot of sin on the World Wide Web. The harvest will always be hindered when people focus on scandalous accusations. Again, we're back to soul winning and hurting the cause of Christ. The harvest of souls is always hurt when someone chooses to spread an accusation. Accusations. My friend, I would... They, these people think they have lots of friends. I would hate to have blood on my hands of the lost who wanted nothing to do with the Baptist church because someone felt it was their job to clean up the church in a universal church manner. Man, I'll take all the blood on my hands if it saves someone from, from, that, from, from that happening to them when it comes to rape. If one soul goes to hell because one believer decided to spread an accusation, it is one soul too many. Again, you're just you're running them in the same vein. They don't go in there. Heaven and hell are real, and never underestimate what Satan will use to keep one person from getting saved. Let, re let me remind you that the lost world can see what is published on the Internet, just like the believer can. Again, these guys really got to get a handle on the Internet and how it works. Number nine, the innocent and weak are often hurt the most. I promise I'm closing with this as far as reading to you. This is the last point he makes. The sad part about accusations is that many innocent will quit church and never return only to find themselves living in sin and experiencing sin, sin's punishment. All because someone thought they should go outside of the boundaries of the local church to handle matters. Always go outside the boundaries of the local church if the local church is going to harbor uh, uh, pedophiles. Always, always go outside. Always. My experience over the years has been that many will stop going to church because they don't want to be a part of the dirt being spread. Yeah, that's probably the reason why I'm not there. The sad part is that their children also stop going to church. Not sad. Many of these who stop going to church will never again get involved in serving the Lord to their detriment. I wouldn't call it a detriment. I enjoy Sundays way more now. I know that some think they should be more spiritual than this, but many are not. God had it right when he let the local church handle matters of accusation and sin. Again, 
very broad terms there. God knew fewer people would be hurt if we handled these matters through the confines of the local church and let the law handle matters where laws have been broken. That sounds great. That last sentence is great, but that's all you needed to say. By, by adding all this other stuff and, 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 and misrepresentation of Scripture, you have made that small statement of no effect, Alan. My desire for this article is not to attack anyone, which is all you've been doing, but to warn of the dangers of going public and getting involved in accusations. You may ask, Brother Domley, I would call him Al, why do you think, who do you think is telling the truth? My answer is, it is none of my business. Very Jack Hiles thing to say. Whether the accused or the accuser is right is not my area. It is my area to try and reach the harvest. Unless it is something that involves your local church, it is best to stay out of the fray of accusations and stay involved in reaching the harvest. Again, this is from Alan Domley, the old Paths Journal. My hand hurts from holding my laptop like that. I should really get a table for this, right? Uh, Publish It Not is the name of the article that he published, ironically, on May 22nd, 2018. So, I read to you from Bob Gray. I read to you from Alan Domley. Now I'm going to read to you from Wikipedia. Cognitive dissonance. In the field of psychology, cognitive dissonance is the mental discomfort, psychological stress, in parentheses, experienced by a person who simultaneously holds two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values. The occurrence of cognitive dissonance is a consequence of a person performing an action that contradicts personal beliefs, ideals, and values, and also occurs when confronted with new information that contradicts said beliefs, ideals, and values. Cognitive dissonance is how, as defined here by Wikipedia, again, this is on the internet, and as Alan Domley said, you really can't believe things on the internet. So if you don't want to believe it, I understand. Cognitive dissonance is how I lived much of my life. As a teenager and as a very young adult, I didn't encounter it because I took everything for granted. And when I asked why and was met with because the pastor said or the Bible says or because that's what Jack Hiles wrote in the Hiles Church Manual or that's what Jack Scott wrote in, Jack Scott wrote in Dating with a Purpose, I went with it. But when I started asking questions, not so much started asking questions, let's be honest here, it wasn't questions for me, it was more doing. When I started watching movies that were rated R or PG-13, had, you know, uh, breasts in them, cursing in them, when I started listening uh, more more heavily, as Bob Hooker would say, to country music, to Christian rock, to rap, um, to those types of musical genres, even Southern Gospel and Josh Groban, when I started listening to those more regularly, I encountered cognitive dissonance. And, uh, Young adults now, people who were teenagers when I was a youth pastor in Morley, Michigan, will tell you that I preached against these movies, that I preached against violent video games, that I preached against uh, Bruno Mars, yet I still used his lyrics in sermons that I preached. So that's a high level of cognitive dissonance, and that's going to drive you nuts. It really is. And as an adult, and maybe even as a young adult, I've talked to a lot of people, a lot of good friends lately uh, that I've made lately, mostly through Facebook, thank you Zuckerberg, that have uh, expressed to me that as a young person they asked a lot of questions or did a lot of things their own way. And it's very difficult because when you're trying to make your own way and do your own thing, and I don't, I don't mean, I mean, if you decide to be a murderer, that's different. But when you're doing things like smoking, drinking, listening to rock and roll, the rock and roll music, excuse me, going to the movie house, as they call it. When you're doing those things, but you're also hearing them preached against, you have to find a way, you have to find some medium to tell yourself that somehow it's okay that you're doing these things, when in reality it's not. And your parents and your pastor and your youth pastor and, 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 and a lot of people that you're friends with are telling you on a consistent basis that these things are not okay. It's very difficult. It's very hard to live in that space. So... Uh, I have a few more things to say. I'm, I'm not quite finished yet. I know you were probably probably hoping for that, but I'm not quite there yet. Let me have another drink here, if you'll bear with me. Uh, and these are not two different types of alcohol. Let me. Uh, this is that's Jameson, uh, the castmates over there, and this is a um, well, Chicago Bulls. This is a uh, Crystal Light drink mix. So it's basically water. Some people would argue with me on that too. Mm. So, I said a lot of what I wanted to say about the Cameron Geovanelli 
on the Sarah Jackson um, case that's going on right now. If you want more details or more information on that, please feel free to reach out. What would be great is if you would go to Sarah's Facebook page, I'll direct you to it, and share her story. Or go to my Facebook page or uh, and, and share the video of Stacey Shiflett that he has since said he doesn't want shared. Um, go to my Facebook page and, and share the video of um, Jack Treber. And I put them together. I put Sarah's story and Jack Treber's statement together. Um, I'm not saying you have to or need to share my stuff for me. It's for you. Uh, if you want to download it, there's ways to download it. Um, I can send it to you directly. Um, at any rate, if you want to do something about this, share the information. And I'm not mad at y'all. There's a lot of, and very few who watch the podcast, watch the podcast, I believe. There's a lot of people who don't really want to get involved but want me to know they're behind it and they support it. And I appreciate that. And I thank you for that. Keep it up. And maybe one day you'll be ready to share. Maybe one day. We're all on our own journey, right? And so wherever you're at on your journey, be there. Live in that moment. That's great. I'm getting off on another thing. But that's what that, these are the responses from the independent fundamental Baptist movement that have been published against Sarah, against Stacy, and for the perpetrator. You can, you can phrase it how you want. You can frame it how you want. And I've seen time and time again, most especially on social media, people that want to be on the side of the perpetrator but not really say they are. When you call them out, they can't handle it. Look, if you're on the bad guy's side, you're on the bad guy's side. Own it. Okay? I've said okay a lot in this one. So... There is another thing that's going on um, that we are gonna we are gonna talk about in upcoming episodes. Um, uh, but there, it, it's widespread though. There's things all over the place. There's all kinds of uh, uh, there's all manner of um, indiscretion, to put it lightly, in the independent fundamental Baptist movement. I'm I am so thankful and so thrilled to. It's not me. Like, I have my ear to the ground, but it's not me. You guys keep me up to date. Hey, did you hear about this? Here's an article. Hey, share this. Hey, what's going on with this? Hey, let me know about that. Like, I am so, so overwhelmingly appreciative of those of you who reach out to me when things like this are coming through and, and, and news is breaking. And, and I'm, not, I'm not at the forefront of this to be a big deal. I have never, I have, let's, let's be real. I have wanted to be a big deal. But the longer I live my life, I'm not that old, but the longer I live my life, the more I've come to understand, I just want to be me and do, uh, um, do what makes me happy and do what brings fulfillment to me. And most importantly, do stuff that helps other people. Man, that's, that's what I want to do. So when you come to me with some information, man, I, I eat it up because I am, I am here to help people. And this is close to me. Uh, things that are coming up soon are very close to me. Things uh, that happen to my mother are very close to me. So that, that, that brings closeness for me to a lot of the rest of you all your story and uh, I do have those stories uh, for those of you wondering I have those stories we still are going to tell them this is again like I said my first episode of just me so I'm kind of feeling this out but I'll definitely be sharing your stories um, sooner very soon because there's a lot of things going on right now that it's very important um, that they've been brought to light so um, there are a lot of things I want to say today there's not a, I can't say everything that I want to say but um, the, I want to go back to the cognitive dissonance for just a moment. I want to read you a couple things that pastors have said uh, in emails, in messages. Uh, if you know me, if you're a personal friend of mine on Facebook, you know that I've shared these things before. So if this is redundant for you, I apologize. You get two drinks, of course. But there are... So many men in pulpits today across the world that have this belief. Oh man, this is going to get deep again. Here we go. That have this belief that women are su supposed to be incredibly, unrealistically subservient to men in relationships. And that's not just marriage. That's in dating. Read Dating with a Purpose by Jack Scott sometime. You'll get a clue. Read uh, uh, Bob Hooker's got a, got a book on marriage, which I wasn't allowed to read. It was too illicit, right? But um, read, read their publications. Listen to their messages. The problem that I had growing up is men from the pulpit make jokes about women calling them cows, calling them um, all manner of animals. Paint the barn is a common one. You remember that one? If the barn needs painted... That's calling a woman's face a barn and saying that she should put makeup on it. What, the, what is wrong with you? 
there is such an, and I don't think it's just this is my opinion but I don't think I'm wrong and I don't think it's just an IFB thing or a cult thing it's a societal thing absolutely I believe but the IFB is not a part of the societal change that's happening that's overturning that mindset. The IFB is not a part of that. So they're staying with the old paths, as they call them. They're staying with the 50s nostalgia, um, uh, uh, Jack Hiles way of doing things. And so men speak from the pulpit and send out publications to husbands and wives and say things that when you put them in, not taking them out of context, by the way, Put them into real-world context, like I do on my Facebook page. They become fodder for us to understand that there is really something disconnected with these people. Generally, I share these sentiments from one or two or three people, but rest assured, not rest assured, be warned. They're widespread throughout the IFB. I'm going to read you a few. Just tell me what you think. I'm going to do my best not to comment on them because I'm running out of time and I have a few more things to read to you. But this is how men, I wouldn't say all men in the IFB, I would never say that, but this is surely how the majority of the pastors in the independent fundamental Baptist movement view women. And by the way, let me remind you, the pastor is the man of God. Everything he says goes. End of story. Um, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. In a world of attractive, loose women, wives, do not let your appearance take low priority. Work at looking good and being attractive. Work at being affectionate and available for conversation as well as intimacy. If you ignore your spouse, you are likely to lose them. As the old saying goes, treat her like a thoroughbred and she won't be a nag. This is marriage advice to young couples from a pastor sent via email. This is, yes, not the entire, um, this is not the entire thread, right? This is not the entire email, but man, that says a lot. All right, so this was a little bit longer, so strap in, or strap on, whatever you prefer. Um, men get their self-esteem from their job or possessions, while a woman gets her self-esteem from her home and family. Visual things matter to men in a different way. Girls, you need not walk around the house naked, though it is not wrong as long as no one else is around. But making love in the daytime is wonderful. Having some kind of candle or nightlight on at bedtime will not hurt. Victoria's Secret and similar attire is very appropriate. A guy can sit and gaze at pornography for hours. Of course it is wrong, but it is real. You are the most beautiful creature on earth, and he can legitimately look at you. Give him some chances. Leave the bathroom door open some when bathing. Invite him into the shower with you. And remember... Clothing in bed is very optional. Too many ladies dress in bed for the for the kids or the appropriate, appropriateness of getting up while forgetting the most important part of going to bed, her husband. Ladies, a bathrobe is easy to slip into. Perfume and clothing in bed ought to be fashioned after the needs of your husband, not the convenience of the household. Visual things really do matter. And can I remind you, though most of what I write is from counseling younger couples, these are being written by an older man. Old guys have eyes, too. That's how he feels. And let me go a step further. It's not just about how he feels. I, I posted this on Facebook and someone said, I thought I was reading an excerpt, an excerpt from Playboy. Really? I mean, that that's what it sounds like. I want you to look at the disparity once again. As children... We are, and, and young adults and teenagers, and throughout college, we are taught, here's, here's the, the premise here, okay? Until you have sex with someone, you don't need to know anything about it. That's the premise. Let me help you understand that. I, I'm not saying that's true. That is absolutely not true. But that is the premise. Until you have sex with someone, or a couple weeks until you have sex with, before you have sex, people pride themselves, and, and, and I know a few people who did this, and hey, Props to you, okay? I'm not diminishing anything you've done. But many people pride themselves on going to the marriage altar without having sex. Beyond that, they, they go to the marriage altar priding themselves in the fact that the first time they actually held hands was the night when they, or, 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 or even touched each other in that way, was the night that he held her arm when they walked down the altar uh, uh, the night before during uh, marriage the, the, the wedding rehearsal. They pride themselves on that. And again, if you, if you actually did that, 
really, props, great, great work. And I, I don't mean that sarcastically. I mean that in a very real sense. But this idea that you need to have no knowledge of anything sexual until right before you get married is ridiculous. But add the layer to that of you know nothing. You, 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 and, and you know nothing about it, and you trust your pastor to implicitly give you everything you need about it. And then he's writing things to you like this and saying things like this at marriage seminars and from the pulpit. Can you imagine what's going on in your mind? More importantly, what's going on in his mind? What is he thinking about? This man that's writing these things, what, what is going on, man? That's some absolute craziness. It is just unreal to me. So, yeah, it, it's crazy. I, I was going to read some of my stories that I have because um, we have a lot. And if you if you have a story about you know an, an instance in the IFB or or growing up in it um, or just something that happened to you, and these are all anonymous, by the way. No one wants me to share their name, and I don't blame them, and I'm not going to. But if you have a story you want to tell, nothing wrong with you telling it on your own. It's it's more powerful for you to tell it on your own, even if you make it anonymous. But if you want me to tell it. Tell me, because I will tell it. And we are getting very close to sharing that episode of the podcast. But for now, I wanted to deal with things that are going on right now. I don't have a congregation. I don't have my people. I just want to talk to you about how I feel about this stuff. Because I think a lot of you feel the same way. Whether you feel comfortable enough sharing it in a post or in a text or reaching out to someone that has wronged you, whether you feel comfortable with that or not, I think it does us well. It's somewhat cathartic for someone else to talk to you that you might feel similar to. You may not agree with me on any of that. You may agree with me on only 25% of it. But I think there's a lot of us that agree on this stuff. And so I wanted to bring to light just what I've been thinking about, ruminating over the last few weeks, um, what's been on my mind, uh, what I've been uh, thinking about and, and, and hearing, all this stuff I've been hearing. And there is more to come, and I will be sharing that in the near future. But for right now, this is, this is sufficient for you to understand the plight and the state of victims who are coming forward. And by the way, people are coming forward in droves. There's a lot of us coming forward. And so the end for the IFB, I don't know how near it is, but it's nearer than it's ever been. Churches that are local to me, churches that are not, um, it's coming, you know. And the, the problem is that so many of these people in positions of authority, while they while we don't know that they were perpetrators of any crimes themselves, they feel an innate need to cover up the crime because they feel like it's going to save their church. I'm not saying it doesn't save their church from some embarrassments and financial ruin. I'm not saying it doesn't do that. It surely does. But what it also does is it allows that perpetrator to walk free. And there's never just one person that they've wronged, that they've molested, that they've abused, that they've hurt in a terrible way. It's never just one person. And when you allow them to walk away from the ministry with simply an apology, or in most cases unscathed, or not even walk away from the ministry, you do what I call the shuffle, and you just put them in a different church, which is happening all over the place and here. When you do that, you give them a whole new set of victims. When you send them out, I know someone personally, when you send them out as an evangelist, and there's there's some, some things, look, if there's questions to be had about someone's uh, morality, don't send them out as an evangelist. Don't promote them within the church. Um, and again, guilty until proven innocent. I'm about it. But when there's questions about that, in a, in a man or a woman that's held a high position at a church, that stuff's got to be vetted before you move them somewhere else or place them on administrative leave or send them out as an evangelist. Do you know that when... Cameron, when this all this came to light about Cameron Giovanelli, he was on tour with a group that included young ladies from North Valley Baptist Church from Golden State College. He was with a group of young people touring the nation, opening him up to even more victims. What are we doing, people? It's unreal. It's unbelievable. But let me end it by saying this. There is hope. There are a lot of us that are coming forward. And if you're thinking about coming forward, I'm not, let me tell you this right now. I'm not going to leak anyone's story, okay? My, my mother 
has her own story of abuse, sexual in nature, in the independent fundamental Baptist movement. I'm very close to her and many other victims. I've never leaked anyone's story. Okay, so please don't fear that. And I'm not saying you need to come to me. If you want to come to my mother, if you if you just tell me, hey, I can't tell you what's going on, but I need some support or help. Who do I turn to? Where do I go? I have at least 10 numbers, email addresses, Facebook profiles that I will have you connect with today that will not spread your information anywhere, that will not tell your name, but will help you. And if and when you're ready, we'll go get the guy that did this to you. I promise you. Very different episode of Not Your Mother's Podcast. Uh, very dramatic as far as, as, I've, as, as much as I've ever been. And uh, very different because it's just me. But for those of you that stuck around, for those of you that uh, want to get involved, that want to help, that have questions, please reach out to me. Please reach out to the podcast. Um, if you want to share your story, if you want to share someone else's story, if uh, there's some things that I kind of alluded to that you that you um, that you're curious about, or you have more information about, and you want to get to me, please help me. I, I appreciate that. I have enough right now, but um, uh, the more the merrier, as they say. So. Thank you so much for, for watching this um, not so much happy, not so much levity, but very, very important episode of Not Your Mother's Podcast. And uh, I'll make sure that the next one isn't quite as intense. But again, with the timeline that's going on right now, it's important that people know about this stuff, that it's going on, that victims are coming forward, and that perpetrators are being taken to task and are being prosecuted. And if you've been a victim... We want to help you achieve the same success. It won't be without heartbreak. It won't be without loss of friends. And I don't say that to discourage you. I say that to, to be realistic. It won't be, it'll be tough, but it'll be worth it. I promise you. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Not Your Mother's Podcast.